This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essays of Francis Bacon. Essay 51. Of Faction. Many have an opinion not wise, that for a prince to govern his estate, or for a great person to govern his proceedings, according to the respect of factions, is a principal part of policy. Whereas, contrariwise, the chiefest wisdom is either in ordering those things which are general, and wherein men of several factions do nevertheless agree, or in dealing with correspondence to particular persons one by one. But I say not that the considerations of factions is to be neglected. Mean men, in their rising, must adhere. But great men, that have strength in themselves, were better to maintain themselves indifferent and neutral. Yet even in beginners, to adhere so moderately as he be a man of the one faction, which is most passable with the other, commonly giveth the best way. The lower and weaker faction is the firmer in conjunction and it is often seen that a few that are stiff do tire out a great number that are more moderate. When one of the factions is extinguished, the remaining subdivideth. As the faction between Lucullus and the rest of the nobles of the Senate, which they called optimates, held out a while against the faction of Pompey and Caesar. But when the Senate's authority was pulled down, Caesar and Pompey soon after break. The faction, or party of Antonius and Octavianus Caesar, against Brutus and Cassius, held out likewise for a time. But when Brutus and Cassius were overthrown, then soon after Antonius and Octavianus break and subdivided. These examples are of wars, but the same holdeth in private factions. And therefore, those that are seconds in factions, do many times, when the faction subdivideth, prove principles. But many times also, they prove ciphers and cashiered. For many a man's strength is in opposition. And when that faileth, he groweth out of use. It is commonly seen, that men once placed, take in with the contrary faction to that by which they enter, thinking belike that they have the first sure and are now ready for a new purchase. The trader in faction lightly goeth away with it, for when matters have stuck long in balancing, the winning of some one man casteth them, and he getteth all the thanks. The even carriage between two factions proceedeth not always of moderation, but of a trueness to a man's self, with end to make use of both. Certainly in Italy they hold it a little suspect in popes, when they have often in their mouth padre commune, and take it to be a sign of one that meaneth to refer all to the greatness of his own house. Kings had need beware how they side themselves, and make themselves as of a faction or party for leagues within the state are ever pernicious to monarchies. For they raise an obligation paramount to obligation of sovereignty, and make the king tanquam unus ex nobis, as was to be seen in the League of France. When factions are carried too high and too violently, it is a sign of weakness in princes, and much to the prejudice both of their authority and business. The motions of factions under kings ought to be, like the motions, as the astronomers speak, of the inferior orbs, which may have their proper motions, but yet still are quietly carried by the higher motion of primum mobile. Essay 52 Of Ceremonies and Respects He that is only real, had need have exceeding great parts of virtue as the stone had need to be rich, that is set without foil. But if a man mark it well, it is, in praise and commendation of men, as it is in gettings and gains. For the proverb is true, that light gains make 
heavy purses. For light gains come thick, whereas great come but now and then. So it is true that small matters win great commendation, because they are continually in use and in note, whereas the occasion of any great virtue cometh but on festivals. Therefore it doth much add to a man's reputation, and is, as Queen Isabella said, like perpetual letters commendatory, to have good forms. To attain them it almost sufficeth not to despise them. For so shall a man observe them in others, and let him trust himself with the rest. For if he labor too much to express them, he shall lose their grace, which is to be natural and unaffected. Some men's behavior is like a verse, wherein every syllable is measured. How can a man comprehend great matters, that breaketh his mind too much, to small observations? Not to use ceremonies at all, is to teach others not to use them again, and so diminisheth respect to himself, especially they be not to be omitted to strangers and formal natures. But the dwelling upon them, and exalting them above the moon, is not only tedious, but doth diminish the faith and credit of him that speaks. And certainly there is a kind of conveying of effectual and imprinting passages amongst compliments, which is of singular use, if a man can hit upon it. Amongst a man's peers, a man shall be sure of familiarity, and therefore it is good a little to keep state. Amongst a man's inferiors, one shall be sure of reverence, and therefore it is good a little to be familiar. He that is too much in anything, so that he giveth another occasion of satiety, maketh himself cheap. To apply one's self to others is good, so it be with demonstration, that a man doth it upon regard, and not upon facility. It is a good precept generally, in seconding another, yet to add somewhat of one's own, as if you will grant his opinion, let it be with some distinction. If you will follow his motion, let it be with condition. If you allow his counsel, let it be with alleging further reason. Men had need beware how they be too perfect in compliments. For be they never so sufficient otherwise, their enviers will be sure to give them that attribute to the disadvantage of their greater virtues. It is loss also in business to be too full of respects or to be curious in observing times and opportunities. Solomon saith, He that considereth the wind shall not sow, and he that looketh to the clouds shall not reap. A wise man will make more opportunities than he finds. Men's behavior should be, like their apparel, not too straight or point device, but free for exercise or motion. Essay 53. Of Praise. Praise is the reflection of virtue, but it is as the glass or body which giveth the reflection. If it be from the common people, it is commonly false and not, and rather followeth vain persons than virtuous. For the common people understand not many excellent virtues. The lowest virtues draw praise from them, the middle virtues work in them astonishment or admiration, but of the highest virtues they have no sense of perceiving at all. But shows and species virtutibus similes serve best with them. Certainly fame is like a river that beareth up things light and swoln, and drowns the weighty and solid. But if persons of quality and judgment concur, then it is, as the scripture saith, nomen bonum instar unjuinti fragrantis. It fireth all round about, and will not easily away. For the odors of ointments are more durable than those of flowers. There be so many false points of praise, that a man may justly hold it a suspect. Some praises proceed merely of flattery, and if he be an ordinary flatterer, he will have certain common attributes, which may serve every man. If he be a cunning flatterer, he will follow the arch-flatterer, which is a man's self, 
and wherein a man thinketh best of himself, therein the flatterer will uphold him most. But if he be an impudent flatterer, look wherein a man is conscious to himself, that he is most defective, and is most out of countenance in himself. That will the flatterer entitle him to perforce. Spreta conscientia. Some praises come of good wishes and respects, which is a form due in civility to kings and great persons. Laudando praesepere. When, by telling men what they are, they represent to them what they should be. Some men are praised maliciously, to their hurt, thereby to stir envy and jealousy towards them. Pessimum genus inimicorum laudantium. Inasmuch as it was a proverb amongst the Grecians, that he that was praised to his hurt should have a push rise upon his nose, as we say, that a blister will rise upon one's tongue that tells a lie. Certainly moderate praise, used with opportunity and not vulgar, is that which doeth the good. Solomon saith, He that praiseth his friend aloud, rising early, it shall be to him no better than a curse. Too much magnifying of man or matter doth irritate contradiction, and procure envy and scorn. To praise a man's self cannot be decent, except it be in rare cases. But to praise a man's office or profession, he may do it with good grace, and with a kind of magnanimity. The cardinals of Rome, which are theologues and friars and schoolmen, have a phrase of notable contempt and scorn towards civil business. For they call all temporal business of wars, embassages, judicature, and other employments, spireri which is under sheriffries, as if they were but matters for under sheriffs and catchpoles, though many times those under sheriffries do more good than their high speculations. St. Paul, when he boasts of himself, he doth oft interlace, I speak like a fool. But speaking of his calling, he saith, Magnificabo apostolatum meum. Essay 54. Of Vain Glory. It was prettily devised of Aesop, The fly sat upon the axle-tree of the chariot-wheel, and said, What a dust I do raise! So are there some vain persons, that whatsoever goeth alone, or moveth upon greater means, if they have never so little hand in it, they think it is they that carry it. They that are glorious must needs be factious, for all bravery stands upon comparisons. They must needs be violent, to make good their own vaunts. Neither can they be secret, and therefore not effectual. But according to the French proverb, beaucoup de bru, poids de fruit, much bruit, little fruit. Yet certainly there is use of this quality in civil affairs. Where there is an opinion and fame to be created, either of virtue or greatness, these men are good trumpeters. Again, as Titus Livius noteth, in the case of Antiochus and the Aetolians, there are sometimes great effects of cross lies, as if a man that negotiates between two princes to draw them to join in a war against the third, doth extol the forces of either of them above measure, the one to the other and sometimes he that deals between man and man, raiseth his own credit with both, by pretending greater interest than he hath in either. And in these and the like kinds, it often falls out that somewhat is produced of nothing. For lies are sufficient to breed opinion, and opinion brings on substance. In militar commanders and soldiers, vainglory is an essential point, for as iron sharpens iron, so by glory one courage sharpeneth another. In cases of great enterprise upon charge and adventure, a composition of glorious natures doth put life into business. And those that are of solid and sober natures have more of the ballast than of the sail. In fame of learning, the flight will be slow without some feathers of ostentation. 
qui de contemnenda gloria libros scribunt, nomen suum inscribunt. Socrates, Aristotle, Galen, were men full of ostentation. Certainly vain glory helpeth to perpetuate a man's memory, and virtue was never so beholding to human nature as it received his due at the second hand. Neither had the fame of Cicero, Seneca, Plinius, Secundus, borne her age so well, if it had not been joined with some vanity in themselves, like unto varnish that makes ceilings not only shine, but last. But all this while, when I speak of vainglory, I mean not of that property that Tacitus doth attribute to Mucianus. Omnium que diserat fesseratque arte quadum ostentator. For that proceeds not of vanity, but of natural magnanimity and discretion, and in some persons is not only comely, but gracious. For accusations, sessions, modesty itself well governed, are but arts of ostentation, and amongst those arts, there is none better than that which Plinius Secundus speaketh of, which is to be liberal of praise and commendation to others, in that wherein a man's self hath any perfection. For saith Pliny, very wittily, In commending another you do yourself right, for he that you commend is either superior to you in that you commend, or inferior. If he be inferior, if he be to be commended, you much more. If he be superior, if he be not to be commended, you much less. Glorious men are the scorn of wise men, the admiration of fools, the idols of parasites, and the slaves of their own vaunts. Essay 55 Of Honor and Reputation the winning of honor is but the revealing of a man's virtue and worth, without disadvantage. For some in their actions do woo and effect honor and reputation, which sort of men are commonly much talked of, but inwardly little admired. And some, contrariwise, darken their virtue in the show of it, so as they be undervalued in opinion. If a man perform that which hath not been attempted before, or attempted and given over, or hath been achieved but not with so good circumstance, he shall purchase more honor than by effecting a manner of great difficulty or virtue, wherein he is but a follower. If a man so temper his actions, as in some one of them he doth content every faction or combination of people, the music will be the fuller. A man is an ill husband of his honor, that entereth into any action, the failing wherein may disgrace him, more than the carrying of it through can honor him. Honor that is gained and broken upon another, hath the quickest reflection, like diamonds cut with facets. And therefore, let a man contend to excel any competitors of his in honor, in outshooting them, if he can, in their own bow. Discreet followers and servants help much to reputation. Omnis fama a domesticus eminat. Envy, which is the canker of honor, is best extinguished by declaring a man's self in his ends, rather to seek merit than fame, and by attributing a man's successes rather to divine providence and felicity than to his own virtue or policy. The true marshalling of the degrees of sovereign honor are these. In the first place are conditores imperiorum, founders of states and commonwealths, such as were Romulus, Cyrus, Caesar, Ottoman, Ishmael. In the second place are legislators, lawgivers, which are also called second founders, or perpetui principes, because they govern by their ordinances after they are gone. Such were Lycurgus, Solon, Justinian, Edgar, Alphonsus of Castile the Wise, that made the Siet Partidas. 
In the third place are liberatories, or salvatories, such as compound the long miseries of civil wars, or deliver their countries from servitude of strangers or tyrants, as Augustus Caesar, Vespasianus, Aurelianus, Theodoricus, King Henry the Seventh of England, King Henry the Fourth of France. In the fourth place are propagatories or propugnatories imperii, such as in honorable wars enlarge their territories or make noble defense against invaders. And in the last place are patres patriae, which reign justly and make the times good wherein they live. Both which last kinds need no examples, they are in such number. Degrees of honor in subjects are, first, participes curarum, those upon whom princes do discharge the greatest weight of their affairs, their right hands as we call them. The next are ducus belli, great leaders in war, such as are princes' lieutenants, and do them notable service in the wars. The third are gratiosi, favorites, such as exceed not this scantling, to be solace to the sovereign and harmless to the people. And the fourth, negotius pares, such as have great places under princes, and execute their places with sufficiency. There is an honor likewise, which may be ranked amongst the greatest, which happeneth rarely, that is, of such as sacrifice themselves to death or danger for the good of their country, as was M. Regulus and the two Decii. Essay 56 of Judicature Judges ought to remember that their office is just dicere and not just dere, to interpret law and not to make law or give law else it will be like the authority claimed by the Church of Rome, which under pretext of exposition of Scripture, doth not stick to add and alter, and to pronounce that which they do not find, and by show of antiquity to introduce novelty. Judges ought to be more learned than witty, more reverend than plausible, and more advised than confident. Above all things, integrity is their portion and proper virtue. Cursed, saith the law, is he that removeth the landmark. The mislayer of a mere stone is to blame. But it is the unjust judge that is the capital remover of landmarks, when he defineth a miss of lands and property. One foul sentence doth more hurt than many foul examples. For these do but corrupt the stream, the other corrupteth the fountain. So with Solomon, fons turbatus et vina corrupta, est justus cadens in causa, sua corum adversario. The office of judges may have reference unto the parties that use, unto the advocates that plead, unto the clerks and ministers of justice underneath them, and to the sovereign or state above them. First, for the causes or parties that sue. There be, saith the scripture, that turn judgment into wormwood. And surely there be also that turn it into vinegar. For injustice maketh it bitter, and delays make it sour. The principal duty of a judge is to suppress force and fraud, whereof force is the more pernicious, when it is open, and fraud when it is closed and disguised. Add thereto contentious suits, which ought to be spewed out, as the surfeit of courts. A judge ought to prepare his way to a just sentence, as God useth to prepare his way, by raising valleys and taking down hills. So when there appeareth on either side an high hand, violent prosecution, cunning advantages taken, combination, power, great counsel, then is the virtue of a judge seen to make inequality equal, that he may plant his judgment as upon an even ground. Qui fortiter imangit, illicit sanguinem. And where the wine-press is hard wrought, it yields a harsh wine, that taste of the grapestone. 
Judges must beware of hard constructions and strain inferences. For there is no worse torture than the torture of laws. Especially in case of laws penal, they ought to have care that that which was meant for terror be not turned into rigor, and that they bring not upon the people that shower whereof the scripture speaketh, pluit super eos laquios. For penal laws pressed are a shower of snares upon the people. Therefore let penal laws, if they have been sleepers of long, or if they be grown unfit for the present time, be by wise judges confined in the execution. Judicus officium est et res ita tempora rerum, etc. In causes of life and death, judges ought, as far as the law permitteth, in justice to remember mercy, and to cast a severe eye upon the example, but a merciful eye upon the person. Secondly, for the advocates and counsel that plead. Patience and gravity of hearing is an essential part of justice, and an over-speaking judge is no well-tuned symbol. It is no grace to a judge first to find that which he might have heard in due time from the bar, or to show quickness of conceit in cutting off evidence or counsel too short, or to prevent information by questions though pertinent. The parts of a judge in hearing are four, to direct the evidence, to moderate length, repetition, or impertinency of speech, to recapitulate, select, and collate the material points of that which hath been said, and to give the rule or sentence. Whatsoever is above these is too much, and proceedeth either of glory and willingness to speak, or of impatience to hear, or of shortness of memory, or of want of a staid and equal attention. It is a strange thing to see that the boldness of advocates should prevail with judges, whereas they should imitate God in whose seat they sit, who represseth the presumptuous, and giveth grace to the modest. But it is more strange that judges should have noted favorites, which cannot but cause multiplication of fees, and suspicion of byways. There is due from the judge to the advocate, some commendation and gracing, where causes are well handled and fair pleaded, especially towards the side which obtaineth not, for that upholds in the client the reputation of his counsel, and beats down in him the conceit of his cause. There is likewise due to the public a civil reprehension of advocates, where there appeareth cunning counsel, gross neglect, slight information, indiscreet pressing, or an overbold defense. And let not the counsel at the bar chop with the judge, nor wind himself into the handling of the cause anew, after the judge hath declared his sentence. But, on the other side, let not the judge meet the cause halfway, nor give occasion to the party to say his counsel or proofs were not heard. Thirdly, for that that concerns clerks and ministers. The place of justice is an hallowed place, and therefore not only the bench but the foot-place, and precincts and purpose thereof ought to be preserved without scandal and corruption. For certainly grapes, as the scripture saith, will not be gathered of thorns or thistles, Either can justice yield her fruit with sweetness amongst the briars and brambles of catching and pulling clerks and ministers. The attendance of courts is subject to four bad instruments. First, certain persons that are sowers of suits, which make the court swell and the country pine. The second sort is of those that engage courts in quarrels of jurisdiction and are not truly amica curae but parasiti curae, in puffing a court up beyond her bounds, for their own scraps and advantage. The third sort is of those that be accounted the left hands of courts, persons that are full of nimble and sinister tricks and shifts, whereby they pervert the plain and direct courses of courts, and bring justice into oblique lines and labyrinths. And the fourth is the polar and exactor of fees, which justifies the common resemblance of the courts of justice 
to the bush whereunto while the sheep flies for defense in weather he is sure to lose part of his fleece on the other side an ancient clerk skilful in precedence wary in proceeding and understanding in the business of the court is an excellent finger of a court and doth many times point the way to the judge himself fourthly for that which may concern the sovereign and the state judges ought above all to remember the conclusion of the roman twelve tables salus populi suprema lex and to know that laws except they be in order to that end are but things captious and oracles not well inspired therefore it is an happy thing in a state when kings and states do often consult with judges and again when judges do often consult with the king and state the one when there is matter of law intervenient in business of state the other when there is some consideration of state intervenient in a matter of law for many times the things deduced to judgment may be meum and tuum when the reason and consequence thereof may trench to point of estate i call matter of estate not only the parts of sovereignty but whatsoever introduceth any great alteration or dangerous precedent or concerneth manifestly any great portion of people and let no man weakly conceive that just laws and true policy have any antipathy for they are like the spirits and sinews that one moves with the other let judges also remember that solomon's throne was supported by lions on both sides let them be lions but yet lions under the throne being circumspect that they do not check or oppose any points of sovereignty let not judges also be ignorant of their own right as to think there is not left to them as a principal part of their office a wise use and application of laws for they may remember what the apostle saith of a greater law than theirs nos schemas quia lex bona est modo quis ia utatur legitimi end of the essays of francis bacon essays fifty one fifty two fifty three fifty four fifty five and fifty six